All right, gang, Genesis chapter 27. Again, Father, please, my Lord, guide us through your word. Place us on your lap. Speak to us as a father speaks to his children. May, hear, may we hear what you have to say, my Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> now, Genesis chapter 27 really begins at Genesis chapter 26, verse 34. Remember that while the Word of God is absolutely inspired, and I believe it's completely inspired, the indexing system added by translators and monks afterward is not necessarily quite as inspired. And sometimes chapters break in funny places or you find uh, information that best belongs in, in the next uh, chapter because it doesn't fit necessarily great in either. <clears throat> Nevertheless, in Genesis chapter 25, we looked at the, the birth and the early years of two twin brothers, Jacob and Esau. And then in chapter 26, we're sort of brought back in time before their birth when Isaac and Rebekah went to uh, Philistine country, to the city of Gerar, because of a famine. We talked about all that and, and how... Uh, Isaac had begun to repeat a lot of the past failures of his father. We talked about how we become like our parents. How many of you were blessed by that one? We do become like our parents. And you can, ch you can say, listen, I will never be like that person. But guess what? It, it, it's just going to happen. You know, That's just the way life is. Well, we looked at... at Isaac's repeating of his father's mistakes, you know, sort of leaving in a time of famine, but God catches him, says, don't go to, to Egypt like his father had previously. And then uh, he lied about his wife and said that, it was, that Rebecca was his sister because he was trying to save his own skin. He was afraid they would be killed, so he kind of throws his wife under the bus, just as Abraham had done like 65 or 75 years prior to that. But now, having looked at all that, now we return back to these twin boys, Jacob and Esau. So we begin at 26, verse 34. When Esau was 40 years old, he took as wives Judith, the daughter of Beri the Hittite, and Basemath, the daughter of Elon the Hittite. And they were a grief of mind to Isaac and Rebekah. Now, when we looked at Esau, we noticed that Esau was a very carnal man. And, and saying that he's a carnal man, the idea was is that he really didn't give a rip about spiritual things. It just wasn't his thing. In fact, one of the, the, uh, the advantages of being a firstborn son, remember that him and Jacob are twins, but he was born first, so he's born a few minutes earlier, therefore he's the oldest son, was that he was given a birthright. And a birthright essentially established him as a leader in the family and gave him a double portion of the inheritance. And there's a great advantage in that. And yet Esau comes in one day from a hunting trip, but didn't go too well. Many of you have been on those hunting and fishing trips where you kind of, well, sometimes the, the fishing is better than the catching. You know what I'm talking about. Uh, and he's hungry. And, and his brother being more of a, an iron chef kind of guy, you know, he kind of works around the kitchen a lot, watches uh, the food channel, and this kind of thing, has, has made himself a lentil stew. And, and so Esau comes in and says to his brother, give me some of that lentil stew. Doesn't that just sound really appetizing tonight? Boy, if there's one thing I want right now, it's a bowl of lentil stew. But evidently it's like what Esau liked because he says, give me a bowl of that stew. And, and Jacob says to him, well, give me your birthright. And Esau says, well, look, I'm about ready to die, obviously. I'm starving to death. I'm only moments from death. And so therefore, you know, let's do that deal. And so he despised, we're told by the scripture, his birthright. That is, he devalued what, what God could have brought into his life. Now, that wasn't God's plan. Understand that. But Esau is a carnal man. He, he actually sells his birthright. That's a pretty bad deal. He sold a double portion of his wealthy father's inheritance for a bowl of stew. That is like one of the worst deals in history. Now, there have been some pretty bad deals in history, right? France sold us Louisiana for about $15 million in the early 1800s. That was a pretty bad deal. Uh, Russia sold us Alaska for what? $7 million maybe, something? $7.2 I think, uh, in the uh, probably... 
I don't remember when that was. I wasn't born yet. Anybody know when Russia sold us Alaska? Came into statehood probably around the 50s or the 60s, right? 50s, I would guess, 57 maybe. Um, there have been some bad deals. Here's one. In 1977, the senior executives at 20th Century Fox made an astonish astonishingly short-sighted decision. They signed over all product merchandising rights for any and all Star Wars films to George Lucas in exchange for a $20,000 cut in Lucas's paycheck. So they said, look, if you'll allow us to cut your paycheck by 20 grand, we'll give you all the merchandising rights to this goofy movie Star Wars that you want to do. Lucas sold his company, obviously, to Disney for about $4 billion in 2012. The merchandise, you know, <laughs> $20,000 became $4 billion, you know. Short-sightedness. He didn't value, that is, Esau didn't value that position and that privilege in his family, he cared more about his stomach. And now he's moved even further away from his spiritual heritage because he's married the daughters of Heth. Who's Heth? Again, if you look at the table of nations, I think it's Genesis chapter 10, verse 15. Heth is mentioned. He's one of the progenitors of the Canaanite peoples. So it's sort of a poetic way of saying that Esau married a couple of Canaanite girls. Now, to marry one Canaanite girl would have been bad enough, but he wasn't satisfied with just one Canaanite. He needed two Canaanite women. Bad idea. Why? What's so bad about that? <coughs> the Canaanites were a deplorable race of people. Deplorable morally. In fact, God had promised Abraham that in 400 years he was going to bring judgment upon those people unless they repented. And so there was no place within Abraham's descendants to, to intermarry with these people. In fact, when Abraham looks for a, a wife for his son Isaac, he sends his servant away up to northern Mesopotamia to find a wife for him because he doesn't want them to marry among the Canaanite peoples. They're going to have judgment coming upon them. It wasn't an ethnic issue. It wasn't a racial issue. It was a moral issue. And these people were in a severe moral decline. Abraham, that's not supposed to be part of God's people. You understand you're not supposed to be in moral decline? You're really not. Will you fall? Absolutely. Will you blow it? Of course. Will you sin? Of course. But you're not to be in decline. That is a consistent lifestyle that will only carry you away from the Lord. So you young people, I can't say this enough, when it comes time to choosing a wife or choosing a husband, choosing your spouse, choose well because your spouse really does affect your spiritual walk for good or for bad. And I can't tell you the number of people I see that have married poorly, even people who were believers, and it's cost them terribly. At the same time, I've seen people who almost married up spiritually. They married somebody who was going to kind of keep them moving forward and keep them accountable, and it's been a great thing to watch. So our attention has been brought back to Esau at those last two verses of 26. Now we go into chapter 27. Now it came to pass when Isaac was old and his eyes were so dim that he could not see that he called Esau his older son and said to him, my son. And he answered him, here I am. And then he said, behold now, I am old. I do not know the day of my death. Now therefore, please take your weapons, your quiver and your bow, and go out to the field and hunt game for me. And make me savory food such as I love. And bring it to me that I may eat, that my soul may bless you before I die. Now Rebekah was listening when Isaac spoke to Esau, his son. And Esau went to the field to hunt game and to bring it. See, Isaac at this time is getting right up there in age. It looks to me that he's about 100 years old. How many of you think 100 years old is pretty old? <laughs> Listen, 100 years old doesn't seem as old to me as it used to. But I'm, I'm halfway there now, you know. I mean, I remember in, in growing up as a kid saying, wow, in, in the year 2000, I'm going to be like, 32 years old. You think about it, that was like 17 years ago. I survived Y2K, you know. And he's, 50, he's, he's like 100 years old, and he's going blind. 
And so he, he senses his age is up there. Now, you know, Abraham made it 175 years old. Evidently, Isaac doesn't think he's going to make it that long. In fact, he'll actually outlive his father by five years. He'll actually be 180 when he dies. But he's 100 years old, and he's going blind. And he says, listen, I don't know the day of my death. Esau, come to me. I've got to, I've got to give you this blessing, you see. He wants to give his son the patriarchal blessing. Now, this is different than the, the birthright. The birthright involved material things, the double portion of inheritance, preeminence materially in the family. However, the patriarchal blessing, what we'll just call the blessing for short, really involved spiritual things, spiritual preeminence in the family, and God's blessing upon him. But Jacob knows full well that God had another plan. You remember back in Genesis 25, verse 23, that Rebecca, when she was carrying the twins, was, was having some difficulty with the pregnancy. She goes to the Lord and says, what's going on? And the Lord says to her, two nations are in your womb. Two people shall be separated from your body. One people shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. The older shall serve the younger. God's intention was that Jacob, not Esau, was going to get this patriarchal blessing. But Esau was favored by his father Isaac, and Isaac then determined to give it to him instead. See, he's being very stubborn here, isn't he? See, now this plan of, of blessing the younger instead of the older was not the social or the spiritual norm. Usually the younger would become subservient to the older. But God, in this particular case, by his what we would call divine election, by simply by God's choice, for no other reason that's what God wanted, was that Jacob would be the, the preeminent son and not Esau. Now, walking in faith, Isaac should have deferred his will to God's will and giving the blessing to his younger son. But that isn't what happened. If Isaac was walking in faith, then he should have made his decisions according to what God wanted, not according to what he wanted. That's not walking in faith, that's walking in the flesh, amen? That's seeking to satisfy this carnal man, not the spiritual man. And if you want to see God's will done in your life, then this is, this is one of the tricks here. This is one of those nuggets. You have to begin to align your life in such a way that it comes in line with what God wants. How many of you have a sense of what God wants for your life? Then what decisions are you making to align your life that way? At some point, you have to get out of the stream that you swim in and get into his stream. Does that make sense? And align your life. And as you align your life in such a way, make your decisions based upon God's will for you, ultimately, you'll begin to find things begin to happen that way. Well, Isaac didn't obey the Lord in that situation. And that strikes me as odd because he's probably a hundred years old or more at this point. He's walked with God. He's seen God bless him. Even while he was in, in Gerar with the Philistines and having to deal with them, even in the difficult times he put up with, God continued to move him out, move him out, and bring him to a wide place where he could be a larger group of people ultimately. Why didn't he follow the Lord? A couple of things we can note here. Number one, he favored his older son. We saw that back in chapter 25. Isaac favored Esau because Esau was a man's man. He was a man of the field and of the hunt. He was a cage fighting, bass pro shopping kind of guy. Rebecca, however, favored Jacob because he was more of a homebody. Another thing is that this plan of God's resisted the social and the spiritual norms of their culture. And so Isaac here is siding with tradition, not with, with God's will. And we have to be careful about that. Traditions are great. If you have family that you actually get along with and you go to their house on the holidays, there are certain traditions, right? Right? Those are great, but they can never come before God's will. And often God's will runs against the grain of tradition. And it's really easy to deny God's rightful place and cite tradition as a justifiable reason, isn't it? 
Well, this is the way we've always done it. Churches, when churches are about to die, you hear those things. Well, this is the way we've always done it. Well, maybe God wants to do it different. The last one, of course, is he was stubborn. Isaac had set his heart on his son. And when it came to denying him the blessing that he wanted to give him, he just couldn't do it. Even with Esau marrying a Canaanite woman, or two for that matter. It was simply a matter of the will. And in the end, listen gang, in the end it's always a matter of the will. And don't forget this, he's at least 100 years old. It doesn't get any easier, amen? The older you get, the harder it gets to change. Change does not come easier as you get older. Learn pliability in your younger years. But if you don't know this, you will learn it in your older years. I heard a story of three church elders who were having an argument with the choir director, who happened to be a woman. And these three men had sort of... uh, banded against her in this theological argument. And, and so as they're arguing, whatever it was they were arguing, the, the choir director says, Lord, I know I'm right. Will you please show these men that they're wrong? Suddenly, big storm clouds came in, dark clouds over the church, and this peal of thunder just rips off. She says to the elders, see? And they said, oh, come on, it's summertime, you know. Thunderstorms happen all the time. So she says, Lord, obviously they're not listening. Please send a bigger sign. All of a sudden, a lightning bolt shoots out of those clouds, hits the church steeple. Crack! She looks at him and says, well... What do you think now? They said, oh, come on, that's just natural phenomenon, you know. You, you can't say that's God. She says, Lord, ugh, you see what I'm having to deal with here? Please send a, a more convincing sign to them. Suddenly a deep voice utters out of heaven and says, listen to her, she's right. She looks at the three men and says, what do you think now? They say, well, yeah, we heard that, but it's still three against two. <laughs> <laughs> that's a classic joke I, you know you guys pinch yourself make sure you're awake you know stubbornness people get stubborn you know so Isaac tells Esau go out and get some game make my favorite meal for me we're going to have dinner here and I'm going to put the blessing on you so Esau heads out to his tree stand to get his game All the time, Rebecca has been eavesdropping. So we see stubbornness here, right? We see Esau's carnality. We see Jacob's stubbornness. And now we'll look at Rebecca's scheming. Verse 6. So Rebecca spoke to Jacob, her son, saying, Indeed, I heard your father speak to Esau, your brother, saying, Bring me game and make savory food for me, that I may eat it and bless you in the presence of the Lord before my death. Now, therefore, my son, obey my voice according to what I command you. Rebecca has been eavesdropping on Isaac and Esau's conversation. And so she determines to make sure that Jacob, who is her favorite son, that he receives the blessing instead. And so she puts together a plan to take advantage of her husband's blindness and trick him into blessing Jacob rather than Esau. Now, Rebecca clearly wants the younger son to receive the blessing. That was God's will, right? But she's going about it the com- a completely wrong way. She's really seeking to establish her will and not God's. And it's defined by the methodology. Verse 9. Go now to the flock and bring me from there two choice kids of the goats, and I'll make savory food from them for your father such as he loves. Then you shall take it to your father that he may eat it, that he may bless you before his death. And Jacob said to Rebekah, his mother, Look, Esau, my brother, is a hairy man, and I am a smooth-skinned man. Perhaps my father will feel me, and I shall seem to be a deceiver to him, and I shall bring a curse upon myself and not a blessing. But his mother said to him, Let your curse be on me, my son. Only obey my voice and go get them for me. So Rebecca directs her son to go get a couple of young goats out of the flock. 
And that she would go ahead and she would prepare him and she would make uh, her, her husband's favorite dish. Now we're never really told. He tells Esau to go get game. Evidently she's going she's gonna to cook up a couple of goats instead. So either goat is gamey or his sense of taste is probably about as good as his eyesight is. I don't know. Is, is goat gamey? Is it a little bit gamey? Yeah, I don't. I've, I've, the only time I've ever eaten goat was in a curry, and that's nice. But, you know, obviously curry will hide the gaminess. Nevertheless, she says to her son, you, go get a couple of kids real quick. I'll prepare them. We'll make his favorite dish. We'll bring it to him, and we'll trick him into giving you the blessing instead. But Jacob protests, not on the basis of right and wrong, but on the basis of getting caught. He says, perhaps my father will notice I'm not Esau because Esau is a hairy man. He says, I'm a smooth-skinned man. And he says, if my father feels my smooth skin and realizes it's me, he might curse me instead. And listen, in, in this culture, this would be like the worst thing that could ever happen, that your father would curse you. This would be a, a horrible stigma to carry the rest of your life. But Rebecca says, listen, let your curse be on me, my son. Only obey my voice and go get them for me. She says, if you get cursed, I'll take the curse for you. Let it be upon me. And that was a fatal statement. Because most of you know this story and what happens. And in the end, Jacob will have to leave and he'll never see his mother again. Indeed, the curse came upon her. Verse 14, And he went and got them and brought them to his mother, and his mother made savory food, such as his father loved. Then Rebekah took the choice clothes of her elder son Esau, which were with her in the house, and put them on Jacob, her younger son. And she put the skins of the kids of the goats on his hands and on the smooth part of his neck. Then she gave the savory food and the bread, which she had prepared, into the hand of her son Jacob. Now, how hairy of a man would Esau have to be that she would have to take the skins of goats and put it on his hands and around his neck? I mean, I'm kind of a hairy guy. I've got one of those backs that you don't want to see. Some of you saw that horrible picture my wife posted on the internet of me. And some of you said, man, the purple wig was bad enough, but the hairy legs are just terrible, you know. But I don't hold a candle to Esau here. Esau is a hairy, hairy dude like George the Animal Steel. You know what I'm talking about, George the Animal Steel? You guys don't know, professional wrestler from way, way back. Became a Christian, died only in probably recent years or so. Became a Christian later on in his life. I'm sorry if I keep making these dated references. I'm kind of carbon dating myself here, I suppose, but... So she essentially cooks up this meal to trick her husband. She dresses up her son, Jacob, to trick her husband. It's all a sham. It's, it's a willful deceit. And you see here what's going on is there's a power play. There's a manipulation between Isaac and Rebekah. Isaac is doing what he knows he shouldn't be doing, and Rebekah is doing what she knows she shouldn't be doing, and each is trying to get their own will accomplished in the process. And they're really polarizing the family in the process. Verse 18, so he went to his father and said, my father. And he said, here I am. Who are you, my son? And Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. I have done just as you told me. Please arise, sit and eat of my game that, my, that your soul may bless me. But Isaac said to his son, how is it that you have found it so quickly, my son? And he said, because the Lord your God brought it to me. So Jacob comes in with the goat curry. He offers it to his father. And his father, first of all, says, Who are you, my son? So Isaac is pretty much blind. But he's not sure if it's Jacob or Esau in front of him. And then Jacob comes, really comes into his own as a deceitful kind of a guy. He answers his father and says, Flat out, I am Esau, your firstborn. A flat out lie. And Isaac was surprised here. It's Esau because it's like, gee, man, you only just went out to get the, you know, to get the game. I mean, how good of a hunter are you? 
You know, are you putting apples and deer cocaine out there or something? You know, you're kind of baiting them into the property? Or how on earth did you do that? And then Jacob says this. He says, I got it because the Lord your God brought it to me. Jacob just didn't just lie to his father and say, you know, I'm Esau. But he actually tries to give God credit for the deception at the same time. This is something that God has done. Look, he brought the game to me. He's giving God credit for something that God wanted nothing to do with. God had nothing to do with. Does that disturb you? Because it's been going on for thousands of years and it still goes on today. Think about the Crusades. They were all done in God's name. Did it have anything to do with God? How about the Inquisition? Or the Inquisitions, for that matter. Did they have anything to do with God? I don't think so. How about slavery in our country? Did that have anything to do with God? Oh, people brought Bible scriptures into play to justify slavery and even to justify racism today. I remember in the, in the church that I got saved in, Sandy and I got saved in, a, an older couple that, that had their opinions about certain races and tried to use the Bible to justify. It had nothing to do with God. It was just their own little hatred in their hearts. And it's the tendency of a lot of people in churches to give God credit for human methodologies and, and humanistic ideas. So a church will go ahead and spend a disproportionate amount of money on stained glass and water fountains and huge social events and call it the Lord's work. This is the Lord's work. I don't think they ever ask God about it. I don't think God's really impressed with stained glass. I'm not saying there's a problem with stained glass, don't get me wrong. But don't build things trying to impress people and then call it God's work. Because it's not. It's man's work. Or a preacher will lay a guilt trip on people about financial giving. And, and all of a sudden that week there's more, you know, there's double the money in the offering or something like that. And then, you know, he says, oh, look how the Lord has blessed. Has God ever laid a guilt trip on you? No, preachers will do that, won't they? But God doesn't lay a guilt trip on people to motivate them to do something. Or a children's ministry teacher maybe has a contest among her students. So whichever kid, you know, brings in the most amount of visitors wins this particular prize and then says, oh, look what God has done. Pitting one child against another in a contest kind of thing. I'm not saying there isn't a place for contests, but be careful what you say God did. Because a lot of what goes on in churches today has nothing to do with God. They just want to put God's name on it. And God doesn't want credit for human methodology or schemes. And He doesn't reward them either. Many will say on that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in Your name and cast out demons and done many wonders in Your name? And then I will declare to them, says Jesus, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice, interestingly, lawlessness. He calls it lawlessness. But we performed miracles. We cast out demons. Look at the buildings we built. Look at the campaigns we had. Look at the monies we spent in your name. Look at the size of the buildings, you know. And I said, get away. I never knew you, you who practice lawlessness. That, I'll be honest with you, when I read that scripture, it scares the pants off me. And it makes me say, Lord, the things that I'm doing, am I really doing them in your name? Is this really because you said you wanted it done? Is this by your authority? Is this by my idea? It scares the heck out of me because I'm desperately running to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant, and to hear these words, get away from me, I never knew you, are the exact opposite of that. Let's make it a point, gang at least in this body of believers, that we're not going to try to attach God's name to our junk. But let's seek Him and seek His ways. Seek His will and seek His power and do it to His glory and not our glory. Let's build His kingdom and not our own. Let's come here to give to Him, not to receive something of ourselves or some notoriety. Let's not touch His glory. 
and let's not give him credit for ours. Amen? Verse 21. Then Isaac said to Jacob, Please come near that I may feel you, my son, whether you are really my son Esau or not. So Jacob went near to Isaac, his father, and he felt him and said, The voice is Jacob's voice, but the hands are the hands of Esau. And he did not recognize him because his hands were hairy like his brother Esau's hands. So he blessed him. Then he said, Are you really my son Esau? He said, I am. He said, Bring it near to me, and I will eat of my son's game so that my soul may bless you. And he brought it near to him, and he ate, and he brought him wine, and he drank. Then his father Isaac said to him, Come near now and kiss me, my son. And he came near and kissed him, and he smelled the smell of his clothing, and blessed him and said, Surely the smell of my son is like the smell of a field which the Lord has blessed. So Isaac isn't really buying the ruse at this point. He's still like, Gee, you know, it kind of sounds like Jacob here. But it feels like Esau. And so he agrees to eat of the meal. So he eats of this meal. And that must have convinced him all the more. You ladies know, if you want to get something from your husband, make him a good meal. That's usually a good way to, to you know, go about that. But then he says, come near, and he smells him and says, my son Esau, like the smell of a field, you know, a field full of sheep and goats. My son who smells like a stockyard, you know. Mm. I don't know. I'm thinking that Esau probably didn't smell that good. Have you ever smelled a stockyard? Remember, these people are, de- these are people who deal in livestock. Have you ever driven in the southern part of, like, Phoenix? Yeah, certain areas of California, Chico, places like that. Man, you can smell a stockyard. You know when there's animals in the field. That's just the way it goes. But he smells his son. He says, "Mm, hairy hands and the smell of a field. There's my boy. And so then he buys the lie. So we've seen Esau's carnality. We've looked at Isaac's stubbornness. We look now at Rebekah's scheming. And yet in verse 28 and 29, God's will is done. Verse 28, therefore, may God give you of the dew of heaven. He's giving him the blessing here. Of the fatness of the earth and plenty of grain and wine. Let people serve you and nations bow down to you. Be master over your brethren and let your mother's sons bow down to you. Cursed be everyone who curses you and blessed be those who bless you. He gives him the patriarchal blessing. Now, I have to make this point. God had said the older would serve the younger. But Isaac has determined to do otherwise. Still, God's will is done and the younger gets blessed, right? Does that justify what Isaac's done? Not at all. And God's will was done, which was the same will as Rebekah's will, in a sense, did that justify what Rebekah did? Absolutely not. They're both guilty of sin. Let me ask you this question. Did God cause Isaac to be stubborn to to make this happen? No, because God doesn't tempt, nor is he tempted, what the scripture tells us. Did God cause Rebekah to deceive her husband so that his will would be done? No, God doesn't tempt, nor is he tempted. Nevertheless, God's will is done. Isn't that amazing? Doesn't that blow your mind? This is why I stopped trying to outthink God a long time ago. Because no matter what I do, he still seems to have his way. Now, Jacob has, excuse me, Isaac's incurred a certain sin upon himself. Rebekah has done the same, but God's plan has been woven through the failures of people. See, this is the advantage of what God has, is he's looking from a completely different perspective. He stands outside of time and space, and so he sees all the decisions you're ever going to make, the good, the bad, and the ugly, and he weaves his plan through it. And you might try to frustrate God's plan in your life, but you're not going to frustrate His plan. You take the rock of your free will and you throw it into the river of His sovereignty, and the most you'll do is make a ripple, but you're not going to change the course of the river. Amen? And this is the one that creates so many denominations, I think. 
the free will of man, the sovereignty of God. And guys have been writing books and arguing this probably for six, seven hundred years now. I heard a great illustration even regarding this concept because it does kind of blow our minds, doesn't it? He says in Isaiah, my ways are higher than your ways and my thoughts are above your thoughts. But just to give you a, a, this illustration I heard, this was great. This is the sovereignty of God, obviously. We're looking at that now. What's that? Are you sure? No. <laughs> Someone knows they're going to get tricked right now. Okay, let me ask you, is that a circle? Is it a square? Is it a diamond? It's a, it's a triangle, isn't it? Okay, so what's this? It's a circle. Is it a triangle? No. Is it a diamond? Is it a square, a rectangle, a parallelogram, or whatever those things we all learned in plane geometry decades and decades ago? See, that's a triangle. That's a circle. They are mutually exclusive to one another, right? Okay. What happens here? <laughs> right. It's a triangle and it's a circle, right? See, if you look at it on one plane, it's a triangle. You look at it from another plane, it's a circle. So two mutually exclusive things can actually be true. What's the difference? Yeah, dimensionality. See, God stands outside our dimension. And so therefore, things that we can't rationalize, things that seem mutually exclusive to us, can still be true to Him. Because he stands outside of our sort of three-dimensional aspect. He's got a totally different dimension. It's the dimension of time. He's not subject to it like you and I are. I heard this. Uh, this is interesting. In the waters around Greenland, there are a lot of icebergs, right? Some of them are little and some of them are large. But if you observe them carefully, you'll notice that oftentimes the little ones move in a different direction than the big ones. They move in completely different directions, even though they're in the same proximity. Why is that? Because the little ones get caught up by the prevailing winds. The bigger ones, because they go deeper, get picked up by ocean currents. You see? The winds represent everything changeable, everything unpredictable, everything distressing in our lives. But operating simultaneously... With the gusts and the gales is another force that's even more powerful. It's the sure movement of God's wise and sovereign purposes. The deep flow of His unchanging love. Unlike an iceberg, however, you can go deep. And you can get picked up in the current of God's will, in the current of God's love, and not have to be blown about by sort of the winds of change. The difficult times of life. They don't have to change your course. You can go deep and get picked up by his current. Looked at stubbornness, we looked at scheming. It was the scheming of the Jews that turned Jesus over to the Romans, wasn't it? They schemed against Jesus because they wanted him killed. And they got him delivered to the Romans by it. And it was the Roman stubbornness that ultimately brought him to Calvary. Remember? That Pilate knew that Jesus had been uh, innocent, that he was blameless, but he didn't. He, he wouldn't take a stand because he was in political. He was in a political uh, uh, tug of war. To go one way would have meant to appease the Jews. To go another way would have gone against Caesar. And he's trying not to do that. And yet, even there. The, the scheming of man and the stubbornness of man still accomplished God's will as Christ went up that hill and paid our price on that cross. Isn't it amazing? It blows me away. It doesn't make the Romans blameless. It doesn't make the Jewish leadership blameless. It's just that God has anticipated all our decisions and he's woven his plan into it. And there's nothing we can do to change that plan. We can kick against it and opt out of it personally or we can bow our heads and move on with it personally. So, picking up at verse 30 now, we look at the fruit of this favoritism that Isaac and Rebekah... Isn't that a great picture? It's a bird standing on one of its chicks to feed the other bird. It's favoritism. 
Now it happened as soon as Isaac had finished blessing Jacob, and Jacob had scarcely gone out from the presence of Isaac his father, that Esau, his brother, came in from hunting. So evidently Esau was a pretty good hunter because he still came back with a, a prepared meal pretty quickly. He also made savory food and brought it to his father and said to his father, Let my father arise and eat of his son's game that your soul may bless me. And his father Isaac said to him, Who are you? So he said, I am your son, your firstborn Esau. Then Isaac trembled exceedingly and said, Who? Where is the one who hunted game and brought it to me? I ate all of it before you came, and I have blessed him, and indeed he shall be blessed. So no sooner uh, had Esau left, uh, Jacob had left with his father's blessing, than Esau comes into his father. Having prepared this meal, he's ready to receive the blessing only to find out that his father already gave the blessing away. And Isaac begins to tremble exceedingly. Now the realization of what has happened is coming upon him. Verse 34, when Esau heard the words of his father, he cried with an exceedingly great and bitter cry and said to his father, bless me. Me also, O oh my father. But he said, Your brother came and with deceit and has taken away your blessing. And Esau said, Is he not rightly named Jacob? For he has supplanted me these two times. He took away my birthright. And look, now he has taken away my blessing. And he said, Have you not reserved a blessing for me? When Esau hears that his younger brother got the blessing instead, he cries with an exceedingly great and bitter cry. His position as preeminent son spiritually had been given away. And Esau here makes the point that his brother Jacob lived up to his name. Jacob, as we discussed before, means a cheater, a usurper, a supplanter, a manipulator. He says he certainly lived up to his name. He says for two reasons. Number one, he stole the birthright from me. Well, hold on now. Did Jacob steal the birthright? Not at all. He made a really, what I would call a, a, a manipulative, he gave his brother a manipulative option, I guess. He kind of took advantage of him and his carnality. But who made the decision? Esau made the decision. Don't blame the devil. Don't say the devil made me do it. The devil doesn't make you do anything. In the end, you make your decisions. Amen? A lot of people would like to blame the devil for all kinds of things. The devil would be more than happy if you blamed him, as long as you don't pay attention to the, the deeper enemy inside. Jacob had tempted him for sure, but Esau is the one who did the falling. And then in terms of the blessing, indeed, he did steal it. He did deceive him. But Esau is bitter, and because Esau is bitter, he's trying to blame everything upon his younger brother. It wasn't all his fault. In fact, Esau's own mother was behind it. As you look at Rebekah, and later on here in a few chapters, we'll be introduced to her brother Laban. You'll find that manipulation runs pretty good in the family. And that she's got some of those same genes in her. Now Esau is crying about what's happened. But he's crying about his situation, but not crying about his choices. He's crying because things didn't go his way, but he's not crying about his lack of character. See, Esau wants a change of circumstance, but he doesn't want change personally. And that just doesn't happen in the Christian life. You have to understand, Christian, that God cares much more about your character than he does about your circumstances. God would rather calm the storm inside of you than, than calm the storm out on the sea. So that in the storms of life, in the difficult times of life, you will be immovable, trusting him not looking for circumstances to change. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14 through 17 says this, Pursue peace with all people 
and holiness, without which no one will see the Lord, looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble, and by this many become defiled, lest there be any fornicator or profane person like Esau, who for one morsel of food sold his birthright. For you know that afterward, when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place for repentance, though he sought it diligently with tears. The writer of Hebrews makes the point that he never repented. He regretted, but he didn't repent. Esau was sorry for his actions, but he wasn't sorry personally for his actions. Or he's sorry for the result of his actions, but not sorry personally for his actions. Much like today's criminal, he's more sorry about getting caught than he is about committing his crime. That is the issue with Esau. Verse 37. Then Isaac answered and said to Esau, Indeed, I have made him your master, and all his brethren I have given to him as servants. With grain and wine I have sustained him. What shall I do now for you, my son? Esau said to his father, Have you only one blessing, my father? Bless me also, O my father. And Esau lifted up his voice and wept. Then Isaac, his father, answered and said to him, Behold, your dwelling shall be of the fatness of the earth and of the dew of of heaven above. By your sword you shall live, and you shall serve your brother, and it shall come to pass, when you become restless, that you shall break his yoke from your neck. So Isaac makes the the point from a spiritual perspective that Jacob is going to be Esau's master. That's just the way it's going to go. The blessing's been given. There's no going back. Esau continues to cry and says, well, don't you have some kind of compensation package? Isn't there some kind of a booby prize or something here? And so then Isaac does give him a blessing. It's an inferior blessing, though it is a blessing. He says, your dwelling shall be of the fatness of the earth and of the dew of heaven. And what he's saying here is that Esau will enjoy material prosperity in fertile lands. As you know, he fathers the Edomites. And it is a fertile area just to the east side of this Jordan, down south. He says, by your sword you shall live. And of course, the Edomites, as you guys know, would become raiders. They have a very fertile land, but they would go out and they would raid other people, groups in the area. And he says, you shall serve your brother. And the Edomites did become subservient to the Israelites, who, of course, would be the downline of Jacob, his younger brother. Then he said this, when you become restless, you shall break his yoke from your neck. And that's exactly what happened In 2 Kings chapter 8 and 2 Chronicles chapter 21, the Edomites revolted against Israel and set up themselves their own king and became a national identity themselves. So Isaac does give a blessing. It's sort of a prophecy of of Esau and of Esau's downline, his descendants who would, of course, become the Edomites. So as far as Esau goes, there's there's a lot of regret here. And there'll even be some revenge. Because of the polarization that's occurred in the family because of the carnality of their own parents. Now verse 41, we look at Jacob's exile. So Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing with which his father blessed him. And Esau said in his heart, the days of mourning for my father at hand, then I will kill my brother Jacob. And the words of Esau, her older son, were told to Rebekah. <coughs> Excuse me. So she sent and called Jacob, her younger son, and said to him, Surely your brother Esau comforts himself concerning you by intending to kill you. Now therefore, my son, obey my voice. Arise, flee to my brother Laban in Haran, and stay with him a few days until your brother's fury turns away, until your brother's anger turns away from you, and he forgets what you have done to him. What? His mother was behind all this. And she says, what you have done to him. Then I will send and bring you from there. Why should I be bereaved also of you both in one day? So Rebekah, having been told of Esau's plan to kill Jacob after his father dies, (coughs) 
then says to her son, listen, you got to get out of here. Things are pretty hot in the house. You need to move up north. Go to northern Mesopotamia to my brother Laban. Until things cool off here a little bit. And she says, and then I'll send for you to come back. Two things to consider here. His curse was upon her. She never does see him again. It ends up that Jacob will spend 21 years in Haran under the tutelage of Uncle Laban. See, Uncle Laban is the dean of the school of hard knocks. And Jacob's been a manipulative person. And you know, there's one thing, one way to teach a manipulative person, that's let them get manipulated. And Uncle Laban is going to take his young nephew to school. He's going to teach him some lessons. So she never does see her son again. We're never really told of her death. We only know that when he comes back, Isaac is, is a widower. What a terrible thing. In her mind, it's going to be for a few days. In God's plan, it's going to be over 20 years. And then Jacob is going to enter the school of hard knocks. See, God's got a plan for Jacob. Jacob's not a good, a good son. You understand that. He's a mommy's boy. I'm not saying being a mommy's boy is a bad thing. So please, no hate mail, ladies. But he is a manipulator. And he does take advantage of his brother. And he didn't have, he could have stood up against his mother and said, no, I won't do this, but he didn't. But thankfully, that's not the end of the story. Because 20 years from now, these two brothers will meet again. And Esau won't be bitter. And Jacob will be on his way back home. And there's always that great hope. Maybe you've been pretty stubborn in your life. Or maybe you've even been a bit of a schemer and deceitful. Or maybe as parents you've made that fatal mistake of of favoring one child over the other. It's easy. Some kids make it really hard to love them. But there's this great hope that God isn't done yet. Jacob's growth as a believer, is is really about to take place now. The next 20 years, God will be working on him. And that's where we're going to go to now. You see, the the Abrahamic covenant has moved from Abraham to Isaac, and now here in chapter 27, it's moved from Isaac onto Jacob. Please understand, gang, that God will have his way. He will never twist your arm. He will never manipulate you. Anybody who wants to walk into heaven must walk there voluntarily. Amen? You can't manipulate anybody into heaven. You can't argue into heaven. You can't drag them into heaven. And you can't push them into heaven. Every person must walk in with his head hung low in humility. The Bible says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All have sinned. All men who have ever lived, save Jesus Christ himself, sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The first people who ever lived, Adam and Eve, sinned and fell short of God's glory. You know what that means tonight? It means you're in good company. All have sinned. And that's terrible news because the Bible says that the wages of sin is death. And the death that's being spoken about isn't physical death. It's eternal separation from God. That our sin has put a wall between us and God. And we cannot make our way to heaven. We can't earn heaven. We can't be good enough to heaven. And so we sit here ready to be judged by God. And sent to eternal condemnation. But thankfully that's not the end of the story. Because though the wages of sin is, is death... The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And that Christ's death on that cross has paid the price so that you and I could stand before God justified if we'll just receive Him. And Receiving Him means a couple of things. It means, number one, repenting of your sin. Repenting doesn't mean just saying sorry. It's not like the tears of Esau. It means actually doing a 180 and turning away from sin and turning to God and moving in that direction. And it means receiving His Lordship in your life. You see, Jesus doesn't just want to be your Savior. He wants to be your Lord as well. You know what that means? That means letting go of the reins and putting them in His hands. 
That means letting go of the steering wheel. And not getting in the passenger seat. I, I know there was those, those old bumper stickers, you know, God is my co-pilot. God's your co-pilot, you're in the wrong seat. And it doesn't even mean getting in the, pa- in the back seat. Get in the trunk. Give him the keys and say, Lord, wherever you want to go, let's go. See, the Bible says in Romans chapter 10 that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Not because you're good. There are none good. There are none righteous. No, not one. But because of his goodness. You'll be saved because you believe what God says. And those who believe what God says, he counts as being righteous because of Jesus Christ, because of what he did for us and paying our sin on that cross. And listen, if you were the only person on this earth, he would have gone to that cross for you. It wasn't just for mankind, it was for the individual. When Jesus Christ went to that cross, he paid the sin for my belligerence, for my rebellion, for my foul mouth, for my manipulative ways, for my pride. And all those things that are in your past, the things that you pray nobody ever finds out about, those things that when you think about them cause you pain and cause you regret and cause you sorrow, he paid for those too. And here's the great news, excellent news. You'll be justified before God. You know what that means? That doesn't mean that God will only accept you. It means there's no record of your wrongs. There is no rap sheet. God has no rap sheet on you. When Christ went to the cross, this was your rap sheet right here. There is no record of your wrongs. You know what that means? In heaven, there's no instant replay. God's not going to replay your life and say to the angels, oh, watch this one. Watch what Billy does in 1976. It's not there. There is no record of your wrongs. His blood has blotted out our transgression. I can't say this enough, gang. The days aren't getting any better. The world isn't going to bow its head to Christianity. You understand that? You're called to live for Him. Not for all these other things. Not for worshiptainment. You were saved from the slavery of sin and been set free to serve Him. Freedom not to do as you want, but the freedom to do as you ought. If you haven't received Jesus Christ in your life, I've got terrible news, you're going to hell. However, I've got great news. If you want to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I'll be here and I will gladly pray with you and we'll talk about these things. But don't leave here tonight not knowing for sure that your account with the Father has been settled. And it's only a prayer away. How far is God from us? Just a prayer away. So Father, thank you. Lord, that though we are a stubborn people and though we are a scheming people and though sometimes we are a carnal people, Lord, that your will is still done. I thank you, Lord, that your plan has never depended on the faithfulness of men. but depends wholly upon your faithfulness. Still, I thank you that you've called us to yourself. Lord, that uh, you've allowed us to serve alongside of you. Oh God, find us faithful to worship you. Lord, simply because of who you are, with no expectation of anything for ourselves, may we just pledge our lives to you because of your goodness, because of your grace because of your mercy. Oh, spare us, my Lord, the uh, obligatory mentality, Lord, and may our, our service and our, our, our desire to follow after you simply because be because of appreciation for what you've done. May we be a people who wakes up every morning remembering that we're saved because of Jesus. May we go to bed and sleep good every night knowing that we're saved because of Jesus, because of your plan. And thank you that in the end, you will have your way. Amen.